they had a huge disappointment because Christ did not return. Um, and so, you know, that part of the story is, is very weird and interesting. But what was even more interesting to me was the aftermath of the story, because this group of Mennonites who had migrated to Central Asia decided to stay there. And they had a Mennonite village in the middle of a Muslim khanate. Um, the khanate of, of Hiva is the name of the, the place as it was called then. Um, and that village lasted for 50 years. In the village was a church, uh, the Mennonites little church that was um, covered with whitewash. And there are a couple of different um, kind of theories or stories about how the village got its name, Okmechet, which means the white mosque. But one of these theories, and the first one I heard, is that because of the Mennonites whitewashed church, um, the local people, people were, it was largely a Muslim population. To them, this was a white mosque. So they called the village Okmechet, the white mosque, which is the story, uh, which is the title of this book in which I go on a research trip following the path of these Mennonites into Uzbekistan. So I'm gonna start by reading just the very first section. This is how the book opens. Um, it opens in Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, where I have just landed. And this first little section I'll read is called Begin with the Glow. Begin with the glow, the faint beam of a half forgotten history. In this darkened hotel room, a trace of ochre outlines the curtains. Push them aside and a fawn colored radiance blooms against my arms, revealing the city below, the dust and juniper trees, the loops of traffic. The light seems to flow from the streets as much as the sky a tint in the air, less a brightness than a universal softening of the atmosphere. It appears to have no single source. It arrives everywhere at once, from all the ends of the earth, from the future and the past. Rumpled sheets, silky patterned walls, a decorative chair in the corner, rigid and remote, like a lady in waiting. I've traveled before as a tourist, a student, a volunteer English teacher, but never for research, never as a pilgrim. Outside, a bus called Golden Dragon, tree trunks painted white, the heat of June, and the vastness of Tashkent, its miles of tended parks, the giant mosques that seem akin to the lonely Soviet structures buildings marooned in the sky, much taller than the trees. The larger everything is, the smaller I feel, the more I sense the glow. My insignificance brings me close to stray, discarded things, to the story that brought me here, to this blade of grass I pluck by the statue of Amir Timur, the conqueror, guarded by angels, born with his fists full of blood. So that's how it starts. That's the very beginning. We're in Tashkent, we've landed. There's gonna be a tour of Uzbekistan that includes some of the you know, wonderful um, sites of the, of the old Silk Road, this very famous trade route through Central Asia. But it also concerns this other small weird story of these Mennonites that I am obsessed with. Why am I so obsessed with this story? I'm gonna read you another small section, um, also from the first chapter, which, uh, which gets into that a little bit, kind of explains um, my interest in this story and why I would go as far as Uzbekistan to follow it up. So this section I'll read next is called Beautiful Error. What brought me here? In a way, I've arrived by accident. I'm haunted by a little piece of history, the story of a small, hardy, stubborn group of people who traveled here more than a hundred years ago. 
I am haunted by a photograph of their church, blanched with whitewash, standing among the poplars of an arid village square. When I first saw it, I imagined its thick walls were made of crystal, that its surface would taste of salt, and that it could contain more than was physically possible, like a word. Because I saw this church in a photograph, I felt I could hold it in my hand. Because the photograph was a century old, I felt I was holding my century, the one in which I was born, the 20th century. Because the church was located in Central Asia, in what is now Uzbekistan, a place I had never seen and of which I knew practically nothing, I felt it was very foreign. Because the church was a Mennonite church, belonging to my own denomination, the faith tradition of my mother's family, I felt it was very close. To be very close to the very foreign is one definition of haunting. As the most prominent landmark of the village where it stood, the church in the photograph gave the place its name, Akhmachet, the White Mosque. To the local population, largely Muslim, the church was a white mosque. Beautiful error, radiant mistake. Whether one is Christian or Muslim or neither, churches and mosques form nodes of powerful feeling. Passions cluster about them. Some perceive them as violently opposed, charged in such a way that they must repel one another. Others would place them together as representatives of the same monotheistic extremist world conquering impulse. But whether you see the forces these places emit as wildly different in character, generating worldviews that can never touch, or whether you see them as unified at a deep level, amplifying one another in a sizzling sibling rivalry, or whether your opinion partakes of both notions, I'm in this electrical storm. My mother's family are Swiss German Mennonites, my father's Somali Muslims. I stand amid this lightning, which here in the 21st century only seems to be growing more intense. And so I wished to go inside the church that was a mosque, its simplicity, its almost blinding power. The church crumbled decades ago. It no longer exists. A pilgrimage then to error, to ghosts, to the accidental, to the glow. So that's the next little section um, that I have for you today. And so this sets the scene, um, not just of where I am, but also of why I'm there and what is my interest in this place. It really was um, an interest in this early moment, this 19th century moment of Mennonite Muslim encounter and interaction that made me so curious to discover more about this place. Um, so I'm going to read, um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the second chapter, which is where we start to get into the story of these people. Um, you know, who were these people and what was their experience like as they made this decision to leave Russia and, and migrate to Central Asia. And there are gonna be quite a few names flying around here. So if you retain these names, good for you. If, you, if the names kind of slip or get confused, um, that's also fine. So the, um, the, the preacher, this very, um, very kind of, uh, very charismatic figure, very influential preacher was named Klaus F. Jr. Klaus F. Jr. is his name. And in order to find out what had happened with these people, I read um, a number of memoirs by folks who were on this journey, uh, on this, this trek to Central Asia. And so I will be mentioning some of these memoirs by these people. The first one I'll mention is a, is a guy named Franz Barch, um, who wrote a memoir called Our Trek to Central Asia. 
And there's also a Herman Jansen, a Jacob Jansen, a Jacob Claussen, and an Elizabeth Unruh. I'm not sure how many of them will show up in the portion I'm going to read. You will notice that the names are quite repetitive. Um, and that is because this was a group that, you know, was a, uh, it was made up of, of, of families and of people who for generations had been a fairly small community. Um, and this is true of, of many, um, of some Mennonite communities today that they, you kind of have the repetition of the same names showing up again and again. So if it turns into a sort of, you know, blur of <laughs> these kind of Dutch Germanic names, um, that's also fine. But I wanna, uh, yeah, I wanna read a bit of, a bit of their story to sort of um, get the, that up close and personal view of what it was like for them. So this section is called Shadows of Earthly Things. Wanderers, they left their farms in Russia, the Amtracht settlement, the villages nestling in the valleys, the bubbling creek Tarlich. In his memoir of the trek, Franz Bartsch records the death of his infant daughter who succumbed to a sudden fever on the eve of the migration. Then we went to the cemetery where we took leave of our little one. They buried her at dawn on a summer day in 1880. By 10 o'clock, Barch and his wife were on their way to Central Asia with a group that would become known as the Bride Community. They were sojourners and pilgrims. They were Germans from the Volga, they would explain to people they met along the way, who were seeking a place where they could practice their faith. They were leaving Russia, for the Tsar had revoked the law that exempted them from military service. All over the Mennonite settlements there, people were selling their farms and moving away, most going west to the Americas. But these, raising the dust with their line of 18 covered wagons, had chosen a different path, a more dazzling vision. It was a vision of the end of the world. For decades, millenarian fever had been rippling across Europe, intensified by a series of populist revolutions that were seen by some as the footprints of Antichrist. One of these prophets was the Mennonite preacher, Klaus Epp Jr. He urged the faithful to abandon the West with its sick collapsing empires and take refuge in the free wilderness of the East in the desert, like the woman clothed with the sun in the book of Revelation, the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. There they would await the second coming. Through his study of Revelation and the book of Daniel, Epp predicted Christ's return with increasing precision until he reached a date, March 8, 1889. Franz Bartsch, a teacher, had at first been skeptical of Epp's prophecies, but had gradually become one of his most loyal followers. He was in the first wagon train, the Corps, made up of families who had attended a special communion service led by Epp. There they had bound themselves together with ties of love and destiny. They had shared in the new ceremony of foot washing. They had given up the formal German pronoun, Z, and addressed one another as Du. They were turned toward the future when they would meet Christ, their bridegroom in Central Asia. I see them setting off in their covered wagons, a line of futurists, of idealists. There were more children than adults. Several sympathetic friends accompanied them part of the way, and a woman left them some fresh cream waffles on a stump. Klaus Epp, too, was there, though he would soon return to the settlement to encourage others to undertake the journey. At the place of the three wells, a place which, Barch writes, remained deeply engraved in our memories. Epp gave a sermon called Shadows and Essence. He used Hebrews 8.5, a text on the shadow of heavenly things. A document, 
I think, is a shadow of earthly things. I read Franz Bart in, a, in the morning, in a pale light barred by the lines between the windows as the tour bus rolls down a highway lined with farms. An open landscape, dun and green, basking in the heat. Mounds of yellow clay piled up where they have been cleaning the canal. The houses are gray brick with roofs of corrugated iron, sometimes painted, so they make quilt-like squares of lavender, orange, maroon. In the shade of a copse, black sheep clump together, richly colored like handfuls of dates. All movement seems slow compared to the rush of our bus. The old men in white caps chatting together on wobbling bicycles piled with clover, the boy pushing a cart of bottled water, the trotting donkeys. Before the departure for Central Asia, Epp referred to Barch's dead infant in a sermon as a metaphor for the old life, which must be left behind like a field of bones. But Barch is a documentarist. His heart loves the earthly things. He craves memorial. Later on the trek, when the children began to die, begin to die, he will give thanks that his own little girl is buried at Amtracht in a grave with a name instead of on the desolate step without a cemetery. The road, their road, fine and dry. Long ox caravans bearing pink salt to Orenburg. Kyrgyz nomads riding their shaggy camels to market. At Irgiz, the last town before the desert, the Mennonite travelers hired a camel caravan and several Kyrgyz drivers. They had to cross the waste to reach Tashkent. The camels would carry their provisions and feed for the horses across the sands. For cooking, the travelers would build fires of dried dung and the brittle desert shrub, Saksaul, which burned a nitrous green. Karakum, black sand. Kizilkum, red sand. The names of deserts. Earth blistered and parched with sun and crusted with salt crystals. A punishing glare, the plodding camel's feet leaving barely a trace. In the evening, the wagons drawn into a circle, a Wagenburg. Hymns on the air as the day cools. Without the Kyrgyz drivers who led them to the wells, the travelers would have perished. Franz Barch recalls the names of these wells, Uchkuduk, Bishkuduk, Kopkuduk, Karakuduk, Kapkarakuduk. Three wells, five wells, many wells, black wells, all black wells. The water of Kapkarakuduk was truly black. When his wife held the lantern close to the samovar, Barch recalls, they saw that the water was dark before they had added the tea. As the sands grew deeper and the journey more demanding for the horses, the Mennonites devised a relay system. Five horses would pull a wagon over a stretch, then men would ride the horses back hitch them to another wagon and pull it forward. Three weeks like this, back and forth over the sand. Such agonizing slowness, the steps constantly retraced, the same ground traveled over and over again, the stupidity of using horses and wagons instead of camels, the scarcity of water, the unremitting heat. In his history of the trek, Fred Belk records that 11 children died between Russia and the end of the desert. Barch includes his own lost infant to make 12. He quotes a letter from Epp received by the community once they had crossed the sands, which compares these 12 lost children to 12 stones. And I'm actually going to stop there um, because I'm very interested to hear um, what my colleague John C. B. Okumu has to share with us. So thank you all very much for listening. 
Thank you so much, Sophia. That was really marvelous. Um, I'm so glad we got to hear from about three from three different um, sections there, and um, I'm sure people will ask you questions about your work later. Uh, but now I'm going to turn to John C.B. C.B. Okumu. He is a Kenyan writer of plays, prose, and poetry with the socio-political evolution of his young country as a major creative canvas. His collected plays 2004 to 2014 were published in 2021. His plays have also been produced in Tanzania and Botswana and have earned him lifetime achievement awards in Kenya and Tunisia. His short story, Belonging, from the collection Nairobi Noir, edited by Peter Kimani, was on the honor roll, or, or also what we call notable works, in uh, the Best Mystery Stories 2021 in the United States, edited by Otto Penzler. His poems have been published in the South Asian Journal, Awaz. And as I said in the introductions, he is with us from Kenya, where he lives in Nairobi. I turn it over to you, John. Thank you very much, Erica. I must start with a word of thanks because of all the linkages that have made it possible for me to be here. It's been a long time in fixing and thank you very much for everybody, to everybody. Um, what did I say? I write plays. I see myself as a playwright because I started my life as a young person uh, on stage, did lots of stage work. And then I was challenged to make a contribution with some plays of my own. So I've written six plays and the last born of them from which I'll read is a play called Kagia, rather in the manner of calling a play by the lead character, Hamlet Coriolanus. Kagia, short for Bildad Kagia, who was one of the freedom fighters, the liberation fighters for our 59 year old country. And in the idea of, of confrontation, the, the confrontation is with the man who actually became our first president, Jomo Kenyatta. And they had different views about the Kenya that should become. Should it be a sort of uh, social democratic entity or should it be highly capitalist, everyone for us, everyone for himself and herself and God for us all. And that's the confrontation. So just before independence, they spend 10 years locked up by the British um, colonialists because they're a bit of a pain. And uh, in Kagia, I have two young journalists on one side of the stage trying to find out how to write a script about this person whom they admire. And I admired Kagia because I came across uh, a biography and rather like Sophia, the idea of research, I thought, hmm, this would make some good theater. So Kagia had a wonderful loving relationship with his wife, Fomboy, and it's settled at the very beginning that they're speaking in their own mother tongue, Gikuyu, and therefore this allows for elaborate diction, which is just elaborate in itself, not sort of hail, the sun has shone brightly today, where are your cows? They're talking in their own mother tongue, so they can do what they like. And uh, at one point in scene 10, uh, we have a different kind of love story because Wamboe Kagia is being interviewed by a young journalist, played by one of the journalists trying to do the research for the film and uh, hiding in the wings and spotlight on her. And she um, describes what it was like growing up. And then thereafter, in scene 11, we go into the business. We know who she is. We have Bildad Kagir himself mourning his wife at her funeral after she's died. So here's one boy responding to the offstage journalist. And you'll just have to pretend that A, I'm a woman, and B, that I'm speaking in a language which is capable of elaborate diction. Yes, our history books have to be rewritten. But there is one important thing. 
it is not enough to remember our freedom fighters and heroes. We must also remember the traitors who betrayed our cause and our people. Your last personal question, as you call it, is quite a challenging one, but I shall try to answer it truthfully. When I was growing up, we were taught to work hard and to serve others. There was water and firewood to be fetched. There was land to be cultivated. There was livestock to be herded. There were homes to be built. And it was women and young girls who did a lot of this work. Of course, there were women who were considered beautiful. I like to think that I was one of them. But it was not beauty that singled you out as a desirable bride. It was how long the furrows you dug. It was how much water you fetched in a day. It had nothing to do with your figure, but everything to do with how powerful a human machine you were, a machine made to serve men. Women knew no such thing as a wardrobe and no such thing as a woman's personal shoe collection. You wore clothes to cover your body and most probably you walked barefoot. If you were lucky, your husband gave you enough money to buy material for a new dress for special occasions, like going to church and weddings and funerals. Women were the property of their husbands. I saw men beating women with sticks as if they were animals, for no good reason and as a matter of course. But from this servitude, you also won your respect in the community as the wife of so and so, and then as the mother of so and so. If you were lucky, you got married to a man who respected you and treated you well. If you were unlucky, you got married to a monster. I suppose that much hasn't changed. A woman was meant to accept the life that was offered to her and to ask for nothing. A woman had no personal ambition except to be a wife and a mother. So much for being a woman. As for sex, now there's a taboo subject. You gave sex on demand without demands, as long as at some point it resulted in childbirth and motherhood. We, I myself, never questioned this scheme of things. It just wasn't the done thing. It's a bit like religion. Beliefs and conduct are ingrained into you. You don't dare to question them as it is sinful to do so. <laughs> One thing a person should never do is to reveal intimate family details to strangers. Have I been happy? Have I been fulfilled? I do not know, really. As I was trying to explain, the pursuit of happiness was never part of the equation. The equation states that one is because of what one does, not because of what one expects. And there is fulfillment in living like that. As for Kagia, I made a point of getting to know and understand the man that fate had assigned to me. I didn't marry him for his looks, but he, observant fellow, married me for mine. And let us not forget that I was a very good dancer. My father couldn't stand him, but that to me was a recommendation. But in all seriousness, I was drawn to the fact that he seemed fearless and adventurous that he was inquisitive of mine. I could see that he could be stubborn. I had a feeling that he would be trustworthy and dedicated and faithful. After all, he had not forgotten his pledge to marry me in all the years that he was abroad. And I tried as much as possible to accept him as he was because I knew that we had to make the best of it till death to us part and that our marriage was never meant to be perfect. Luckily for me, I married a good, decent man. It was hard for me and the two children all the years that he was away in detention. And it was hard for me and the children, more of them as it turned out, all the years that he was engrossed in politics. But I saw my role as a supporter and protector as much as I could support and protect because I respected him and what he stood for. My own needs were always an afterthought. That's all I would say on the matter. Thank you. Scene 11. Kagia eulogizes. Kagia, one boy, pardon me. 
He enters slowly and deliberately through the audience and positions himself mid-center stage to address an imaginary congregation of mourners, taking in the whole audience. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Thank you for coming to be with me at this burial ceremony. I stand before you a man diminished. Half of me is gone, half my sight, half my hearing. Henceforth, I am to lie in my bed alone. People are always keen to ask, how did you meet your wife? How did you meet your husband? We met in a small village here in Moranga. In those days, her full name was Deborah Wamboy Nelson Gitau, but she was known as Miss Nelson. I was smitten by her, but I was too scared to declare my intentions verbally, so I put them in writing sometime after I had arrived at my posting in the army. She replied in the affirmative, which for the youngsters among you means that she said yes. To my proposal of marriage. To tell you the absolute truth, I had first thought of marrying someone else, but she was too slow in responding. I do recall that Miss Nelson carried my metal suitcase to the railway station when I left for Egypt as a soldier. She had to wait for me for four years, yet her faithfulness to me was never in doubt. It would have been sinful of me to betray her trust and steadfastness. She suffered blows because of me at her father's hands because I joined the army and went away. She suffered blows because of me when my political foes sent their lackeys to try to kill me. She was persecuted and even imprisoned for being associated with me, yet she never wavered in her resolve. One boy was a resolute woman she took care of our first two children alone during seven of my years in restriction. She ignored the many taunts that swirled around her ears. She was a thick-skinned shield to my combative soul. I would not have done what I have done had she been faint of heart. She shared my vision of the world. I know I wouldn't have done what I have done had she spurned the life that I offered her and our children had she assailed me constantly with comparisons to other men who had seemingly done better than me. Her affection and support were a constant solace. However, such as human decay, that she spent her final days weak and bedridden, a shadow of her former self. She needs to rest now. She must rest now. She has gone on ahead of me, but I am sure that when my time comes, Miss Nelson will help to carry my baggage as part of the reception committee to the eternal life beyond life. I yearn to follow her. That is all I have to say. I'm going to read you a passage from the collection Nairobi Noir, and I was encouraged to write prose by the editor, my friend Peter Kimani author of the book Dance of the Jacaranda, which is featured in your bestseller lists, and for which I read the audiobook. So uh, such as our love and affection that Peter said to me, um, write a short story, and I did. It's entitled Belonging, because Kenyan society is made up of several races, as indeed are many societies these days, of whom the minorities are South Asian, Indian, and Caucasians, European, English, what you will. And in this story, I'm saying that once you choose a home, you are subject to the whims and the social challenges of being in a certain place at a certain time. And here, two English people are the victims, the sufferers of a violent robbery, such as do continue to, cont to occur in our country. We can't deny that. Felicity Haywood showed surprise when her husband came in with two unfamiliar African men. She was sitting on a scarlet red sofa, reading a novel, but she stood up immediately as if to acknowledge the entry of superiors. Bach's cello suites, interpreted by Casals, were playing soothingly but unobtrusively from a CD. Felicity had auburn hair that was tied in a bun, and she was wearing dark-rimmed spectacles. Dido, the cat, 
was a silent onlooker lying in a basket on a drinks cabinet. Good evening, Mrs. Haywood, Juma said. I have a gun. The weapon was not visible in its belt holster covered by his coat, and my friend has one too. Don't do anything stupid. Sasa, hand over your cell phones. Haywood's mobile was in his pocket. His wife's was in her handbag on a side table. Juma gave them to Kizito, who switched them off before placing them in the side pocket of his suit. May we sit down, madam? Kizito asked, speaking for the first time. Yes, do sit down. Felicity was trying hard to hide her fear, calling to mind what she had often heard, that in these situations, it was best to keep the other people talking and get them to relax. Thank you, said Kizito. Do join us. Soon they were all seated, Richard and Felicity beside each other on the sofa, and the two strangers in armchairs opposite them. Very good. They call me Juma, and this is Kizito. And you, Mr. and Mrs. Hayward, are fellow Kenyans, interjected Kizito. That makes me very happy. So rest assured, we will not hurt you, unless, of course, you make us. His voice was higher pitched than Juma's, and he spoke very deliberately, like a politician addressing gullible Wanainchi. When did you become Kenyans? he asked. We were both born here, Hayward responded. My wife and I are third generation. Ah, the children of our colonial masters, Kizito said, in a manner of speaking. And where did you go to school? The Prince of Wales, now Nairobi School, Hayward answered. What a privilege, Kizito said. But our past is past. We are now in the same boat, except that those whose grandfathers served the wishes of your forebears have now taken over, but they are worse than the white man. Now it is the turn of the sons and daughters of home guards to oppress the sons and daughters of freedom fighters. We must not forget our history. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Hayward? I have no great interest in politics. Oh, but you must, you must. Everything in life is political, Kizito rejoined. Kizito, Juma cut in. That's enough. Watch a maneno. I'm going to read you two poems, and uh, they are sad poems. And may I read a poem in imitation of the writing style of a Ghanaian poet called Kofi Awanor, a celebrated poet from Ghana who was killed in the September 2013 attack at the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi. He had been invited to participate in a literary festival. And in this, since I had known him, a man of about the same generation as my father who'd been, and like my father who'd been, educated abroad, uh, I saw similarities and I saw him at the opening ceremonies, but didn't get to actually do something he'd done because he went off with his son to do some shopping and sightseeing and fell into the midst of a shooting spree and was killed. Mentor across the ether. You first revealed yourself to me as a faceless poet dwelling within continental anthologies. You wrote lines like taking a shit in a shrine in Kyoto, then on another page, and strip joints beneath spinning buttocks. What words could best describe you? Unabashed, combative, sworn enemy of grandstanders, or were you simply translating from a tongue stripped of prudery? I was to discover that you, like my father, had also walked before me the streets of caustic cities like New York, Moscow, London, and Paris had also conjured up before me a poised response to the white man's contumely, which gave me courage when my turn came. I was to discover your sworn enemies, the despoilers of the common good, the traducers of the people's aspirations, the abusers of conferred responsibility, 
I never did get to see you in the flesh, but your words remain. You said what you wanted to say and let no one else say it for you, which gave me courage when my turn came. May the oarsman take you to that invisible place whence you will still come to join us as you wish. And may dance, laughter, and impropriety perhaps be found there too to make you happy. And uh, the final poem, uh, Song of Sorrow, is after his death. And in terms of craft, because I'm still exercised as a poet, I've been writing poetry since I was a teenager. But the debate is, do we sort of imitate uh, whatever is happening in American poetry? Do we do Robert Frost? Do we do Langston Hughes? Or do we try hard to create a Kenyan sublime? But here, I'm trying very hard to follow at least the rhyme scheme of a sonnet. And there are more lines than 14, but you know, it's going A, B, B, A, C, Z, whatever it does. So Song of Sorrow, uh, the last reading. I hope I've stuck to my 22 minutes. I didn't time it, it could fit. In memory of Kofi Awanor. Word spread of an inordinate shooting at a shopping mall through frenzied phone calls, through text after text. Nobody away from it knew how to respond at all a feeling of impotence that put many sorely to the test. You and your son were out exploring at the time, but no one knew quite where. Painful consolation was to be found in knowing that the young man survived the violent crime. You, salt eater of more years, had fallen, lifeless to the ground. When the news sank in, we first felt a certain numbness, followed by a conviction that the festival must continue unchanged as the best way to offer rebuke to your zealous killers and doubtless more in keeping with how you would have wished to be honored. But our pluck gave way to mordant grief and we decided upon a halt, our sorrow beyond belief. You had made it clear, no weeping at my funeral, do you hear? But as you can understand, we have decided to ignore all that. How can we not mourn our mischievous warrior, the pen his spear? For that is our way. How can we so swiftly reject those observances which make us different? Forgiveness after condemnation also is what wisdom decrees. We are enjoined not to envy the violent or to choose their ways. So in days to come, speak to us through the wind to allay our fears. Speak to us through the thunder to warn us against the bad conduct. Speak to us through the rain, the better to disguise our tears. Speak to us through the lightning to startle us into commitment. Speak to us, Kofi Nyedevu Awonor. Speak to us knowingly from that far off door. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, both of you, I was writing down uh, lines that just were so um, striking and I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on naming what some of those are so that I can give maybe others a chance to gather their thoughts about what they would like to ask you. But in giving them a moment, maybe, maybe I'll start with a question. Okay, and of course you two, I think know that if you have questions for each other, please um, feel free to ask them. But I think I'll start with one um, um, that came up for me as I was reading both of your works. And that is, um, I'm gonna start with a quote from Toni Morrison. So she said, you know, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't, been written yet, then you must write it. And I'm wondering, you know, on a similar note, um, when both of you started out as writers, and I kind of think also that we constantly become renewed as writers about what we would like to read, what we would like to see out there. Um, was there a conversation that you wanted to have 
or one that you wanted to join and expand on, but that maybe you weren't yet seeing yet out there. And so you started writing it. You started having that conversation first, maybe with yourself or with others. I'm just wondering what conversations or explorations most interested you either then or now. Um, and maybe there's a connection between the two. Wow, thanks, Sophia. Erica. That's that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think um, so. It, it's interesting because I think your question brings up. Uh, so it's about conversation, which means it's about community and and interaction, but it's also about beginning as writers. Uh, and so, in a way, it's also about solitude. Right. So it's like both of those things at the same time, because you begin sort of, you know, nobody's talking to you because you're just starting. And so and how do you start a conversation by yourself? You know, you can't you can't really do that. You need someone to be in conversation with you. And I think for me, um, if I think, you know, and it has changed for me a lot, as you said, over the past decade or so of writing and publishing. But I would say uh, when I began writing, some some early conversations I wanted to have were about um, were about language, and particularly about the language of fantasy and science fiction, which I saw at the time as very um, kind of blunt and streamlined, and and sort of getting to the point and not and not particularly lyrical. Rightly or wrongly, that's how I saw it. And so I wanted to have conversations about genre and about, you know, bringing lyricism into genre fiction. And it's still something that interests me, although I also think, and in fact, we had a powerful example in John's reading today, the 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 second piece, the piece from Nairobi Noir, that this kind of very direct prose um, can also be extremely powerful and extremely gripping. Um, but I would say, yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm still interested in sort of different styles and when we employ different styles and for what purpose, that's a conversation I'm very interested in. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Sophia. Erica. I, I would definitely say in your introduction, this idea of Kenya being 59 years old this year, I think the United States of America is a, a bit older. So a lot of things that one takes for granted in your part of the world are very nascent. So it's very much a tabula rasa. One can almost, uh, I don't know how many people do um, Sophia's kind of writing in Kenya. I'm trying to think, and perhaps not yet. So uh, it's so challenging this, but for me, uh, the intersections about this idea of identity, my own education, which was very, very sort of, to put it in a word, privileged, that took me into the heart of sort of British uh, thinking and culture, and then being, as you see me, as black as coal, and therefore, uh, what am I? Where do I stand? And where do I stand in a country where all the, you know, their labels, their their ethnic labels, people hate each other. And through my reading and through, I, I want to be expansive, but I can see that these forces are very, very strong. So um, the subject matter is there and the canvas is as wide as somebody like me would like to make it, which is a, which is a, a wonderful privilege to be in as a writer. Thank you so much, um, John. I really appreciate that. I was actually thinking about, um, I guess I was thinking about identity, which you pointed to there, about all these different forces coming at you, and even the pressures of being in, as you say, um, a younger country. And I assume that you're referring to when Kenya got independence from Britain in, exactly. in 1963. Because that's when it became a political entity with, with boundaries. I mean, I'm sure we were all sort of walking there, so the tropics and the Sahara. Yes, we were there for a long time. But the right. idea, you mean you become a citizen of a country, I presume, when you live by its laws and edicts. 
I'm not sort of knocking the Ugandans or the Tanzanians, but maybe I could do things in Uganda that I can't do in Kenya. So my particular preoccupation is with the boundaries that confine me through laws and customs and norms. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm attached to, mm -hmm. not rabidly patriotic, but I would like to Im improve the environment in which I live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And art is one way of exploring it. Yeah, do, do either of you experience pressures on you given that um, at least from my reading where I sit in the United States, um, identity politics at the moment are quite strong, even in the art world, to identify with a particular group or represent a particular group. And there's an, some people in an audience are looking for particular authors to speak to particular um, subjects. I'm wondering if if either of you feel those pressures, if you even, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't wanna go on a long tangent with my question, unless you would like me to clarify my question, then I can That's give fine. an example. Sophia, but if, you go first all the time. <laughs> why? I was just gonna ask you to go first, John. <laughs> um, well, um, but I don't mind. Yeah, do. Yeah, go no, first. go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, Erica. Uh, I think, yes, there are always those pressures. Um, one is asked to, to represent a, a group, to speak for, um, to speak for people, um, to speak to contemporary issues. And I think that it's really, you know, for me, it's been it's a it's kind of a constant negotiation you know there's 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 what do certain communities ask of me um but then there's also what am i drawn to as a writer which you know if you're lucky those will be the same thing that makes it a lot simpler but there are also times when it's going to be completely like you as an individual are going to be interested in something that seems to have no relation to, you know, what people might be wanting to hear from you and wanting you to write about. And that's when, you know, that sense of negotiation comes in for me between, you know, um, like, how do I figure that out? And how can I, how can I address these things at the same time? Or if, I'm not interested in what someone is asking for. Is there another approach to that same question that might interest me? Um, so it's that, yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of back and forth for me. I don't know, John, how it is for you. Uh, my answer is going to be simpler. I feel no uh, compunction to be a spokesman or spokesperson for anybody because I keep on going back to this mantra of, young days and um, some of my best friends are South Asian and Indian some of my best friends are like you Erica and some of my best friends are like Sophia simply because I've grown up with these people all the time so with the idea of being the great unifier in my own mind the great unifier is just saying hey look folks um, let's look at ourselves another way and I'll write you a story that um, proves that we're all in the same boat you see these two Europeans who are being faced with a, a, a violent robbery, uh, their skin color all of a sudden means nothing because those robbers will leave their house and come to mine next. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, I'm speaking, I, I wish to speak, a bit, it's a bit highfalutin, but I would wish to speak for uh, everybody. And I, in terms of ethnicity, I wouldn't dream of wishing to speak for my ethnic group or my tribe. I think I'd have really let the side down then. I th I love that. I think that's a wonderful. Um, I think that's really where where you want to be as as a writer is to be um, is to be a voice that is not that is not confined that is not confined to any particular kind of position. I'm wondering if anybody in our audience has a question. I see a number of things in the Q and A that are are just people are affirming yes, we can hear you, which I love. Um, I also want to affirm for John and Sophia that 
from my end. The technology was very good. Both of you were very clear. I know we all have anxiety about whether the 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 audio is going to start to judder, um, but I I didn't experience any of that. So all of that went quite well. Yeah, I think it went great. Thank you, Erica. Um, I see a comment from um, Michael Trochia. I'm just going to share it for the whole, it's both comment and a question. So I'll just go ahead and read it. Mm. Um, Michael mm. thanks us. It wasn't just me, but for putting this together. Uh, thank you, Sophia uh, and John. Uh, myself. Uh, I have a question for both Sophia and John. Sophia, you've touched on this in a previous answer with respect to your approach to science fiction and finding more spaces for lyricism within that genre. Has your work in fantasy and science fiction somehow informed your approach to your new nonfiction work? Um, and then there is a question for John too, and I'll I'll say that, and then Sophie, either one of you can go first. So it says, and John, how has your work in playwriting informed your approach to prose and poetry? So, <laughs> gosh, uh, again, let's. Uh, I'll go first. Maybe I think I think that what uh, what one when you sort of do writing courses i think that um you sense weaknesses i probably have weaknesses in description but uh whoever asked that very kind question i think that i do have a strength in creating dialogue because you're used to speaking other people's lines so in other words i i think that the idea of speaking to each other in various sort of kenyan um, idioms and, and whatever is a strength. But I think the weakness is that for the prose, um, the prose, one is always inhibited by the greats. I mean, you think, oh, Dostoevsky, what can I do next kind of thing. So, um, you know, uh, and I also have a Francophone background. So I'm getting sort of Victor Hugo, Baudelaire, and um, no, uh, I think craft is the word that I evoked earlier. I'm forever working on my craft to be consciously aware of what I'm doing with my keyboard or my pen. So dialogue is a strength and there are lots of weaknesses to improve upon. Thanks, John. Um, so has my science fiction and fantasy writing influenced my nonfiction writing? I would say that for me, I don't experience it that way. I don't, I don't feel it or sense it as a, as an, as an influence moving, you know, from one to the other. Um, what I do feel is that there is a consistency um, across my work. Uh, in other words, when so I'm a fantasy and science fiction writer. When I then decide to go and write nonfiction, what am I writing? I'm writing about these people who, you know, through a certain reading of the Bible and a lot of calculations with different numbers that appear in different Bible verses have concocted the idea that Jesus is coming back to meet them on a specific date in a specific place. This turns out to be a total fantasy. It was, it was as if they were, you know, for that, for that period of time, it was as if they were living inside their own fantasy novel. So, and that is, you know, part of just trying to figure out like, what would that have been like and how, how, how strange that is. And that kind of very fuzzy border between fantasy and reality, this is part of what draws me to the story. So rather than saying that one influenced the other, I would say that essentially I'm weird all the time. And so whatever I'm doing, whether it's like actually fantastical writing or it's nonfiction, there's going to be some interest in the sort of outre, the bizarre, the, the, those, those um, strange experiences. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm just going to comment that I love the way in which, uh, just to 
tie you two together that on the um, on your book flap for the white mosque, Sophia, just because you just brought up the word weird, it actually says, and I don't, I'm not always a fan of the book blurb flap, but I actually think yours was very well done. I don't know if that's you or the editor, but it does talk about, you know, how out of the tissue of life with its weird incidents, buried archives and startling connections, does a person con construct a self? And, you know, John, in your piece, um, I think in the intro to your piece, Belonging, you said something very similar about, um, I'm going to get it wrong, but about sort of the challenges and the whims, like you find yourself, no matter the home that you've chosen, you are subject to the challenges and the whims in a certain place and in a certain time. And I see those sort of intersections coming together, sort of the weirdness that you can find your yourself in there. Um, that's just I, so, of, Erica, I sensed yeah. a, I certain, a certain uh, from Sophia, the idea that uh, something that means a lot to me, an idea that research is key to the whole process. So for example, when uh, Sophia was talking about Franz Spark and Hermann and Jacob Jensen and everything else, I think you, you do have the right to make believe, but you know, based on sound research. I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have written Kagia if I hadn't uh, done a lot of research on who they really were, met Kagia's daughter, met members of his family, uh, met his best friends, and, you know, interviewed people in the minority uh, fringes who had been victims of robberies, uh, some far more gruesome than the one I've evoked, if I dare say that, mm -hmm. uh, with much more sort of, you know, physical trauma. This is all sort of sweet and namby-pamby, but the, the key word research I think uh, I think if I were giving writers courses to any young person, is you can't make it all up. It's got to be based on something. Yeah, otherwise you're subject to other people's fantasies and get sort of locked in there. So it's it's good to have both. I'm just gonna read one last question from um, Haley Edwards. She writes. Uh, this ties into a part of the conversation from a bit ago, but I'm so interested in the idea that as writers, you are navigating the boundaries of your own real life situations, but in sharing your work and experiences, you are extending past them, particularly in the cases of language and cultural boundaries. What types of limitations do you think you face when writing and how do you work past them? That's a great Ooh. question. Great question. Yeah. It, it deserves a yeah. three-hour lecture. A uh, three-hour lecture it coming up. <laughs> it does. Do you want to go, John? Uh, I could go first and just say uh, the big uh, the big debate where I am, you know, south of the tropics is language. Uh, language and uh, and it's a it's a big debate, you know. My my university professor Ngugiwa Thiongo, I'm sure you've all heard of him. Uh, we we're still grappling with this thing of uh, how to write in a language which isn't ours. Basically, that presents, you know, what I'm saying. And so, do I see a fellow writer who hasn't quite got the same facility with the English language? that I had through my education and say, this is inferior, the creativity, the germ and the story, but uh, we're not using the present subjunctive, we're not using the perfect infinitive, does that make it weak? And, and what's going to be the fine balance that's going to create a work of art, which as I've said before, is representative of a Kenyan sublime. And by that token, perhaps you, Sophia, and you, Erica, won't understand it. You won't necessarily feel comfortable with it. I think you felt very comfortable with my writing. I think next time I read, I should make, I should make you slightly less comfortable because of what I'll be doing with the language as used where I am. 
I don't know whether I've expressed myself well. Yeah, I think so. I think very well. Um, I mean, yeah, and this is a, a a debate that we know is 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 old and and ongoing in many parts of the post-colonial world. I mean, of course, the African continent, but other other places as well. Um, so, yeah, I I um, I want to I want to just look at Haley's question again there, particularly in the cases of language and cultural boundaries. What types of limitations do you think you face, and how do you work past them? Well, um, I think actually, you know, to go back to something that John said earlier, which I agree is absolutely fundamental. Um, research, research is is key. One of the ways that you, if you're trying to extend your own um, practice of writing, um, one of the ways that you extend is by not trying to do everything by yourself, right? You, you, you collaborate and you link up with other people. And part of that is actually through reading. I mean, when you uh, get a book and study it for research purposes, you are you are in connection with that author with the author of that work and that person is helping you and i um you know did an enormous amount of research in writing the white mosque um and like uh john part of my practice was also talking to people um it was also you know sending the manuscript before it was published I sent copies of it to everybody that I had mentioned in the book because it's a, it's a narrative about a journey I took with other people. So I changed all their names, which is common practice in American publishing, but still, you know, I don't want to have the book published and here they can recognize themselves and they had no idea and maybe they didn't like something I said. So I had to send the manuscript before it was published and say, this is this character represents you. If there's anything you don't like about it, let me know. You know, and and so that that kind of um, practice of of learning and interacting with others, whether through you know archival research or through uh, conversations with living people, I think that it brings in um, a sense of humility that is also that also actually speaks to the reality of the work, which is I can't do everything myself. I am not the be all and end all of this work. I am a human being on the planet with other human beings. And, you know, there's nothing really that any of us accomplishes um, alone. And so that's that's an approach that I think um, it makes it makes the practice exciting and interesting that I'm going to meet other people and hear from them and learn from them. I'm going to learn new things rather than making it a a scared, like I'm limited and I can't do this and I can't do that. It's more like, exactly, I can't do it. So I'm going to, you know, find a way, find others who can, who can help me and who can interact with me on this, on this subject. Well, that's, those are both wonderful answers. Um, Sophia, I think you said, read in the first section that the narrator recognizes the smaller I am, the more the glow. <laughs> and you're sort of saying that in what you're in what you're saying um, there. And so much in your work, John, I heard you just amplifying other voices, other people, which I really appreciate, uh, and so many voices. And I appreciate <laughs> all of you. Uh, who could come and be with us today and listen to these two wonderful, thoughtful writers. Um, I hope that we see you again in the future at an in-person reading or a Zoom reading. And I wish everyone um, a wonderful rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And I'm gonna sign off now. Thanks to both of you and um, hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you both. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.